So today I want to talk about a film that probably not a lot of you have seen, but you should definitely check out. Before I get into that, I'm just going to talk about the director. John Frankenheimer was an acclaimed director who began his career during the Cold War period. He was sort of a pioneer for the political thriller genre as we know it. His most famous film is The Manchurian Candidate. I told them to build me an assassin. I wanted a killer from a world filled with killers and they chose you. But he may also be known for Birdman of Alcatraz, French Connection 2, or Grand Prix. None of those, however, had the distinction of being his favourite film. Which one did he give that honour to? The Gypsy Moths is definitely the oddball in the Frankenheimer catalogue, at least in terms of genre. Despite the extreme sports setting, in this case skydiving, it's a character-driven romantic drama. It's about skydivers, yes, but it's also about people. Young people, old people, disaffected people, people with nothing to live for, people who may be chasing death. I don't think about it one way or the other. You almost went to the ground. Same thing at Lawrenceville. Now, how can you not think about that? Our protagonists are three men who travel the country doing barnstorming shows for money. We have the former soldier, Mike Rettig, played by Burt Lancaster. We have Joe Browdy, the snarky yet god-fearing man, played by Gene Hackman. And finally, Malcolm Webson, the lost young kid, played by Scott Wilson. Their travels take them to a small town in Kansas called Bridgeville, just in time for a 4th of July weekend. Malcolm has family there, in this case an aunt called Elizabeth Brandon, played by Deborah Carr, and an unhappy housewife who lets the three stay with her to liven things up a little. You said it was terrifying. Yes. Well, I suppose in a way that's what makes it exciting, isn't it? The Gypsy Moths is a film full of contrasts. The contrast between boring suburban life and exciting on-the-road life. The contrast between marriage and one-night stands. The contrast between youth and age. Characters with directly contrasting lives all come together for this one weekend and then separate forever, unable to coexist. You have contempt for us, don't you? Who? Oh. Certainly everybody here this afternoon. John Frankenheimer's output before this was what he described as character-based action movies that were almost entirely male-centred with very little female presence. He was a director that really embraced the methods of New Hollywood, and The Gypsy Moths was his first film to abandon the studio completely and film everything entirely on location to create a sense of realism. Yes, I, I mean, I shouldn't think you'd have to do anything in particular to make it more interesting than it is to begin with. The whole film is practically bathed in sunlight, almost to let the viewer feel that they are there on that 4th of July weekend. The rain that falls after a major character dies is there to encourage the viewer to mourn along with them. The repeated cutaways to a marching band rehearsing for the 4th of July parade reminds the viewer that life goes on despite the tragedy that happens. We're a little out of place here, aren't we? Rowdy and I, anyway. John Frankenheimer had worked with Burt Lancaster before, and the Gypsy Moths marked their fifth collaboration together. Burt Lancaster got fame in the golden age of Hollywood for playing rugged, manly heroes. You've been shanghaied aboard for the last cruise of the Crimson Pirate. His most famous role was in From Here to Eternity, where he shared a steamy kiss on the beach with Deborah Carr, so the reteaming of them here is definitely not a coincidence. I was wrong once! About uh, 1953, I think, wasn't it? <laughs> 1953 is when From Here to Eternity came out. Mike Rettig, in some places, comes across as a subversion of the typical Burt Lancaster leading man. Why are you taking so many chances now? What are you trying to prove? He's a man without a purpose, living only to defy death, and he's found a way to exploit this for entertainment. You came too damn close before you opened your shoe. I came for a show, listen little kid. It's quite telling that a scene of a normal family dinner at home is then followed by a scene in a strip club where Rettig is told he might be more at home. The paradise might be more the sort of place that would appeal to you. What sort of place would appeal to us? And his eventual one night stand doesn't happen with Mary, the casual stripper, but with Elizabeth, the respectable housewife. How terrifying. He wants to make a life with Elizabeth, a woman he's known for all of two days, and when she tells him no, he seems to lose all reason to live. Ah! 
Perhaps his tryst with Elizabeth gave him hope that his life could change. Once the reality hits, he decides to go out doing the cape stunt. This character isn't completely original, but John Frankenheimer's direction and Burt Lancaster's performance help elevate him slightly. There's always another choice. Don't you see that? And I wonder if it was intentional on the director's part to cast someone who had been an action star in the golden age of Hollywood as someone who's now losing interest in his exciting life. Sometimes I think you hate to come back to the ground at all. The protagonists who get the most focus are divided into Rettig and Elizabeth, both played by Golden Age stars, and then Browdy and Malcolm, both played by stars of New Hollywood. Another contrast in the film, and note how the film contrasts the three love scenes. We get a tame conversation and nothing else between Malcolm and Annie. It's full of sexual tension that never goes anywhere beyond a kiss. Then we have the aftermath of a quickie between Browdy and Mary, where neither party was that interested. Finally, Rettig and Elizabeth have a passionate love scene. Of course not. We're delighted to have you. Elizabeth is there to be a foil to a lot of the other characters. She contrasts the exciting life of a skydiver with that of a housewife in a small town. Most ordinary people can't help but respond to the idea of some excitement in their lives, you know. Her life is not shown to be better or worse than the men's, given that she has a loveless marriage to John and there is mentions of her having affairs before. Does it happen often? No, not often. But it happens. Not much of her life is shown outside of this one weekend, and all we know about her is that she's the chairwoman of a woman's association. She's the opposite of Rettig. He's the thrill-seeker that wants a normal life. She's the normal, respectable figure that wants a taste of excitement. How do you come to have this wonderful freedom of choice? For them, the taste of the opposite life doesn't improve their own at all. What's the difference? You have to want it. Rettig realises he can't have a normal life and falls to his death, while Elizabeth is terrified of unpredictability. I imagine you're the sort of man who always manages to find the best and rightest reasons for everything you do. Do you think that's possible for everyone? Elizabeth also contrasts with Mary, the stripper that Browdy brings home. In her past, she had expected to marry Malcolm's father, who eventually ended up with her sister. I don't know, I... I guess I just wasn't very observant. And so she settled for John. And it was all right, too, for a long time. Mary is a tamer version of this, hoping for Rettig and settling for Browdy. The one in white. The best we have for you well, I like the one in the red, did Yeah, so did I. The statement that John Frankenheimer seems to be making here is that differing lifestyles can sometimes have the same problems. In some ways, Elizabeth refusing to run away with Rettig could be seen as her atonement for having a loveless marriage with John. He wanted me to go with him. The last lines between them do suggest that there could be hope for their marriage after all. The thought terrified me. And me. Another contrast in the film is that of Browdy's two conflicting characteristics. He lives the life of a rock star, travelling from town to town, entertaining people and hooking up with various women. I love her, I really do. Will you marry me? Yeah, right, Tuesday. I'm tied up till then. But he's also a devout Christian, going to church every Sunday. He also seems to be embarrassed by this. Brownie goes to church every Sunday. Okay, okay, okay. Does that embarrass you, Mr. No, well, it doesn't embarrass me. I mean... He's easily the most into the strip club scene of the three guys, but his post-coital monologue is followed by a scene of him in a church. When Rettig falls to his death, he whiplashes from his jovial MC mood to making the sign of the cross. There's a lot about Browdy's character that's left up to interpretation. Did he find religion late in life? Is his alpha male attitude an act he feels pressured to keep up? Gene Hackman does a lot with this part that's arguably the least important of the four leads. You said you almost went to college. Oh, you... Didn't work out. <laughs> John Frankenheimer called the scene where Browdy talks about doing the cape stunt to be his favourite in the whole film, entirely because of Gene Hackman's performance. I mean, there was a couple of seconds there when... I think I felt like the cape would actually keep me up. It doesn't matter which one of us does it. So I'll do it. Malcolm as a character seems like he's there to be the foil to the older men. You ever see his hand shake up there? He has elements from both their backstories. He has the troubled, nomadic backstory that Browdy has, while also the same looking for a purpose in life that Rettig has. Well, why didn't they ever take you, the Brandons? I never asked. 
Out of the three romantic pairings in the film, Malcolm's is the healthiest. I don't know very much about it, but I do know when it sounds good. Annie isn't married to someone else, nor did she settle with Malcolm. Their interest is brought on by an emotional connection rather than a physical attraction. They only share one kiss, which is brought on by the heightened emotions surrounding Rettig's death. Like there was some magic word to say. I couldn't say that word. Because I don't know what it is. The scene gives them the modesty it didn't give to Rettig and Elizabeth, or Browdy and Mary. We never see how far they went. Annie also asks Malcolm to stick around. You won't stay for a while, though? Contrasting with Elizabeth refusing to run away and Mary being disinterested. Annie is even there to see Malcolm off right before he performs the final cape stunt. The last shot of the film shows Malcolm waiting for a train that we never see if he gets on. It's not said where he's going or what he plans to do next, and it's left open what he might actually do. You don't mind my not staying, do you? For tomorrow, I get lost, will ya? We have to wonder if he'll turn his back on domestic life like Rettig was implied to, or he'll go back and reconnect with the family that obviously want to still keep in touch with him. I'd like to know how you are. I will. The Gypsy Moths is not a perfect film. Some of the scenes between Rettig and Elizabeth feel a little too melodramatic for a romance that the film is trying to paint as shallow and unfounded. Merciful stranger, come to save me from the terrible boredom and lovelessness of my life. Is that what you think you are? There are a few other moments as well that feel a bit forced and contrived. And next. And next. <clears throat> Clashing badly with the movie's low-key, naturalistic tone. I wouldn't even know what to say to them if they were still here. Start by saying hello. See how it goes from there. But by the sum of its parts, The Gypsy Moths does have a lot going for it, and more people should really know about it. And honestly, I can see why John Frankenheimer would call this his best film.